What is one of the most dangerous things you as a leader can say? It is this. We tried this before around here and it didn't work. That is a surefire way for you to squash innovation in your organization. And that is the topic of my conversation today with John Coyle. John is one of the world's leading experts in design thinking and innovation. He is a speaker and lecturer. He's a graduate of Stanford University. He is a world-class athlete in two sports, an Olympic silver medalist, as well as an NBC Olympic sports analyst. And in our discussion today, we talk about how leaders can foster innovation in their organization while maintaining decisiveness. So the whole idea is how you can get ideas from your folks and narrow those ideas down, take action on them, and make sure that people understand that you are willing for change if the change is focused on the right things that can help your organization move forward. John is full of key insights that are going to be extremely helpful to you. I put a link in the show notes to his website, and so make sure you check those out. And listen to John's interview and think specifically, how can I change the way I show up with my people in my leadership so that I make sure that innovative ideas are getting generated and that the right ideas are then getting acted on? That's what this interview is all about. Feel free to share it with other people that would benefit from it. Please give us a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, thank you for listening to Construction Genius. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. John, welcome to Construction Genius. Thank you, Eric. It's great to be here. What is the most dangerous thing a leader can say to those whom he or she is leading? You know, I think the most dangerous words uttered in war rooms, hallways, boardrooms, cubicles, all around the world right now is the following. That won't work. We've tried that before. That won't work. We've tried that before. So I work with a lot of companies and I hear this all the time. I'm a, you know, I'm an innovation leader, sometimes consultant, and that's what I'll hear. And, and my very next question will be, oh, well, when did you try that? And a very common answer is, well, that was back in 86, mm. which I point out that was 35 years ago. The world might have changed by now. Mm. And I'll tell you a quick story from my career. I worked for a wireless company and in our wireless company, we didn't have a free phone promotion, even though AT&T and Sprint and all the others did. And when I joined, I said, why, won't, why don't we have a free phone promotion? And I was told, well, that won't work. Legal won't let us. We tried it. They said there's something to do with the tax code where we're home-based that won't allow us. And so I heard that enough times that I started repeating it to people that I hired. Mm. And this just perpetuated around 9,000 people. And then I hired somebody new and I learned this concept I'll share with you in a minute about how you've reframed that. And I decided my new recruit that came in, when he asked me, why don't we do a free phone promotion? I instead said, you know, we've had a problem getting through that through legal. Maybe, maybe we should just check with them. And I fully expect him to come back with it won't work right then he came back and said you know i spoke to somebody new at legal they found a loophole we're pretty sure we can do this and three weeks later we launched our first phone promotion free phone promotion in the history of the company it's very interesting so why do you think leaders think like this what where, where does that come from well you know almost every new leader new manager gets there by developing expertise and finally getting people that report to them and their first instinct is to prove that they're worthy of this role right so they want to share their knowledge it comes from a for most people it comes from a place of good intent and they don't want you spinning your wheels and so they're going to keep sharing their knowledge and closing holes and not letting you waste your time on things they think are impossible. But when you do this repeatedly, it actually causes a change in neurochemistry. If you like, I'll explain. Please do. Yeah. So it's a really a three strike thing. So you're sitting in a meeting, somebody throws out an idea. Hey, why don't we do a free phone promotion? And the leader says that won't work. We've tried that. Before. Well, neurochemically, everybody in the room at peer level and lower switches to emitting catecholamine and cortisol, which causes you to narrow your perspective and get less creative and dumb. So, so, so just so I'm, I'm following you, the leader says something and the the group immediately kind of goes in line with what the leader's saying. They not only go in line, they shut down creatively uh -huh. because they feel like they just got judged. I could get judged, so I'm not going to utter anything else. So you just quelled the whole room. Now it's 
temporary. Now this new employer, whatever, comes back with another idea. Do they go to the biz- busy room and shout it out? No, they come to you alone. And they say, hey, what, you know, we should do this. And if you say as a leader, oh, we don't have the budget for that. Now they've been shut down twice. Do they bring the third idea? Maybe, right. maybe not. But when they've been judged enough times, they shut down permanently. They just stop bringing it. And here's the triple whammy, the, the strike three, is that people, they join companies and they leave managers. Right. And the number one reason that people leave managers is because my boss is not open to my idea. So you've shut down the room, you shut down that individual, then they leave. When you do that enough times, all the creatives have left. And guess what? You're blockbuster. You can't yeah. see what's happening right in front of you. Okay. So let's explore that a little bit. So I, I do get promoted because I know what I'm doing. Right. Okay. And so someone comes to me with a new idea and I know in construction, you know, hey, great. Thanks for your new idea, but we've got a project that we got to get built. We want to make some money on it. We got to do it safely and we got to do it on time. Maybe we'll try your new idea next time. How can someone who's in a place of leadership, so to speak, open their minds to those new ideas and not shut down that creativity? Great question. There are times, Eric, you do not add, this is not a, a suggestion you abdicate your leadership role. There are times where you have to say, team, I had to make a decision. I had limited time and this much data, but here's the path we're going forward. They expect that, right? That's your job as a leader. When time is of essence, like it's sort of like when the house is burning, you don't hand the fire extinguisher to the new employee and say, what you ne- do next, hold the nozzle and you aim, you know, you don't do that. But when you have some time and space for a bigger question, a strategic question, a creative question, if you don't canvas the team, if you don't get those ideas, if you don't let them be heard, and if you're not open to possibility, you will kill the creativity of your team permanently. Okay, so I'm, I'm hearing there that I, I, as a leader, am responsible to create time and space for people to be able to share their ideas with me. Can you give me an example of what that time and space would look like? Sure, and uh, is it sort of a wrinkle to this as well? You have to judge ideas, it's essential, but when you judge them in the moment, hey boss, I have an idea, sort of like set and spike. If you spike that ball down, we've tried that before, that won't work, we don't have budget, whatever that rational reason is, you've killed that person's creativity in the moment. So the better way to structure it, which all sort of creative innovative firms do, is they set up a time and space for generating ideas, and then they separate that in time from judging ideas. So let's get all ideas on the board, no judgment, everybody gets more, more creative, nobody's shutting them down. Then you switch to, okay, now it's time for us to to validate some of these, which of these have the most merit, which we think we can launch, which are quick wins, which are longer term strategic, which do we table? And when you separate the divergent thinking from the convergent thinking, Mm -hmm. then you keep that creativity alive with the group. But when you slam people down in the moment, when they throw out an idea, you're going to kill that team. Okay. So let's talk about that then. In your experience, the time and space for generating ideas and the time and space for evaluating or judging the ideas, is that taking place consecutively on the same day? Or are you talking about separate days, separate times? How does that work? I don't think it's that important. There's some merits to having some time to mull things through, like gestation period. So when I run ideations, I like to do divergence one day and convergence the next day. Right. Things will simmer up. And, you know, a lot of times one of the great things about doing this is the worst ideas sometimes find a wrinkle that has merit. Right. Right. So you have something that's really out there and everybody's sort of scoffing at it. And then the night goes through and the next day you're like, you know, if you just re-angle that a different way, there's potential there. And, you know, some of the best ideas tend to come from some of the craziest wacky ideas. They're not the same idea. They're just adjacency. Yeah. Okay. So let me explore this with you then. In, In your experience, what are some effective ways for leaders to generate ideas from their team? Uh, it's really, this is what's amazing. It's really not hard at all. You simply say, it's time for us to generate ideas. We're not going to judge them right now. Let's get everything we can think of out on the board. More ideas is better. As Linus Pauling said, the key to having great ideas is to have a lot of ideas and get rid of the bad ones. Tomorrow or an hour later or in 10 minutes, we're going to judge these. But for the moment, there's no judgment, no bad ideas, throw out anything. Let's get creative. Let's get everything out there. Get them captured, pause, take a break water break, overnight break, whatever it is, and come back and say, you know, let's start evaluating these and building off of them. That's the the most simple process. And by the way, that's the core of what we're going to talk about in another session, which is design thinking. The separation, generation of ideas from the judgment. Okay. So let's, let's, let's just go back to that leadership perspective. So someone gets promoted and on the one hand, they might be sort of proud because of their promotion, but on the other hand, they're feeling a little bit insecure. And I know a lot of a lot of the folks that I work with, they they have trouble with the shift from thinking like someone who's responsible for building a project right. to someone who's responsible for building and running a team of people. Right. What are some effective ways for a new leader to, to make that shift in thinking from project-based to people-based? 
you know, I think the, the biggest shift is to recognize that their job no longer is to have all the ideas. Hmm. It's to create a team that can generate out of the box ideas. And then your job is to, to be the champion of those ideas. And when you're the champion of your team versus the only ideator, it's a vastly different culture. That's interesting. Tell me a little bit more about that. When you say the champion of the team, what do you mean by that? So people feel the most empowered when they are intrinsically motivated versus extrinsically motivated. You can't, you can't throw people in a room and go, I ate, damn it. That, that never will work, right? right. You have to give them a challenge and say, you, you people are smarter than me. I'm too in the box here. Like, help me see this differently. Mm -hmm. This is well, I'm stuck. I think that we can't do a free phone promotion, but, but maybe there's a way. Can you help me find a way? Because we need this to compete. And when you right. give them that empowerment and free them up, they're going to think of things you can't because you've been there too long. One of the biggest problems with leadership also is that means you've been there a while. Yeah. And so you get stuck in your status quo. You know, the famous quote is you can't read the label when you're sitting inside the jar. Yep. It's really hard to see your way past the status quo when you've been there a while. How does someone how does someone balance the the need for new ideas with the need for the company to stay true to their culture and their purpose and their mission? Those kinds of things. Yep. I mean, the metaphor that comes to mind is like walking, right? We have two legs. Right. You have to have values, you have to have a purpose, you have to have quarterly earnings. These things are important, right? You've got to keep the business running, right? which unfortunately tends to be risk averse and status quo and operation yes. focused and micromanaged. Yes. That's one leg. If you're not using the other leg, say also we need to be looking at the future, looking yeah. at potentially more risky things, looking for opportunity, getting rid of the status quo in an ideation session for the moment. You have to do both. If you're not doing both, then you become Blockbuster or Sears or Borders or you name it. Yep. So it's kind of that yes, but also right. way of thinking. So exactly. we do things this way, but also we're always open for thinking about new ways of doing things. Yes. And I'm going to come back to that. Yes. And which is a phrase from uh, improv. We'll, we'll co cover that at the end because I know how you're going to bring me to this. Uh, I will share one other what I call the innovation equation. Yes, please. And it's my favorite line in any meeting or any time I'm speaking to somebody. And it's when they tee up something that in the book, Crucial Conversations, is called the sucker's choice. Uh -huh. uh, they'll say, well, if we do this good thing, then this bad thing will happen. Mm -hmm. And this sort of presupposes that life is like science. When you add like uh, baking soda to vinegar, it's going to bubble over every single time. Mm -hmm. People aren't like that. Like human behavior is not as predictable. Mm -hmm. but when you set up this false dichotomy that if we do X and then this bad thing will happen, you've actually, you've eliminated all other possible. But there's a simple way to reframe this. And I'll give you an example in a second where we change an entire industry uh, by simply saying, well, what we want is X, good thing. And what we don't want is Y, the bad thing. Right. Now you've created possibility. The first framing eliminates all, it doesn't even allow for generating ideas. Mm -hmm. The second tease up, hey, how might we? So I'll give you the example from my old industry, which is wireless. In 2010, every single person in the country that wasn't on a prepaid phone line had a contract. And that contract had a early termination fee somewhere in the range of $500 to $1,000. If you tried to leave before your 200, a two year contract was over, then you were whacked with this term, termination fee. And the belief system was the following. Well, if we get rid of contracts, which we knew by the way, were the Number one pain point in our industry, we were lower than utilities right. in customer satisfaction. If we get rid of contracts, then everyone will leave us and go to the competition. Right. This is a belief, $1.3 trillion industry from the CEOs to every person in customer service, everybody right. will leave it. Right. And I learned this framing back then. And I, I said to my team, I was leading innovation for the company at the time. I said, what we want is to eliminate contracts because we know customers hate them. And what we don't want is for all our customers to leave us. Right. Now, at first that seemed impossible. Right. But after some several weeks of brainstorming, we came up with the idea. We're like, wait, we're in the carrot stick model of the universe here. The entire industry is using the stick to whack you if you try to leave. Let's go with the carrot. Let's create a rewards program. The longer you stay, the more you pay, the more bank you earn. You can actually earn your free phone faster and you'll never have a contract because you've got money in the bank and nobody's going to walk away from money in the bank. And we launched the industry's first uh, contract-free uh, post-paid uh, post phone program, gave it with a reward system, and we simultaneously reduced churn, or people leaving us, and yep. increased revenues at the same time. And now nobody in the country has a contract anymore because Tebow will copy it, and then they just made it amortized outside of it, which isn't nearly as good as a rewards program, but at least you're not in a contract, you're welcome. Sure. Okay, so then I want to change my thinking from if we do this good thing, then this bad thing will happen yeah. to... What we want is the good thing, and what we don't want is the bad thing. 
Correct. So instead of having sort of a, a, um, a consequential way of thinking, I separate them out completely. Yep. And then the thinking space is one where I'm going towards the good thing, but then also keeping in mind how to avoid the bad thing. Exactly. How and, you interesting. Know, in the infinite possibilities of the universe, there's always a way. Like there's yep. always a way. Yep. What if I'm one of those leaders and, and if I'm being honest, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bad at this. You know, I, and, but I want to change. And, and we all know as adults that change is incredibly difficult. How should I, as a leader, begin that change process as I'm showing up with my team? Do I need to make a speech about it? What do I need to do here? Yeah, great question. You know, one of the easiest ways is to adopt something from improvisational comedy or improv. They, you know, their job, they're standing in front of a brick wall or green screen, right? there's no props, there's nothing. And their job is really to keep the creativity flowing and keep the conversation going to create humor. Uh, you can consider your job as a leader the same without the humor part. To keep right. the conversation going, keep the creativity going, at least when you're around projects that require innovation. And so they have three rules. You never say no, you never say but, and you never say can't. So if you bring that to your team and say, we never say no, we never say but, we never say can't. Instead, we say, instead of no, you say, I wish, you know, no, we can't do a free phone promotion. Legal won't let us. I wish we could do a free phone promotion. How might we do that? Uh, what also happened with that same free phone promotion is one of that same associate that brought me the, the idea that solved it said, let's do it with this new touchscreen phone. This was an $800 phone. Right. And I'm like, there's no way. We don't have $50 million <laughs> of promotional budget. That's what I wanted to say. But instead, I, I, I said, you know, I wish we had $50 million to cover this co-promotional budget. He went and he talked to LG America as he got a $50 million co-promotion budget. I didn't even know that was possible. Right. But I don't know what I don't know. Right. right. So never say no, never say can't. You say, how might we or how could we? And never say, but, and this is the one you referenced before, you say yes and, yep. right? So, well, if we try to roll this out in the entire country, we're going to run out of inventory. So as much as I like to do this, you know, but we can't, you say, yes and, how do we manage inventory? Maybe we need to roll this out regionally first so that we don't run out of funds. And so when you institute these rules from improv, you're keeping the conversation going, you're keeping the creativity flowing, and you're stopping yourself from shutting down your team inadvertently. Another quick way to do it is to get somebody in your team to give you a wink, wink, nudge, nudge when you start getting to knowing on them. Yeah. That's that's eventually what I did. No, that's really excellent. The challenge that sometimes leaders face is they, they come into a room with, with you know an enthusiasm for a new pursuit of creativity, and yet they've conditioned their people in such a way that the people are skeptical. They don't want to step out because perhaps the last time they did, they got whacked across the head or something like that. If I'm like that, do I need to sort of, do I need to say, hey, listen, guys, I know that normally this is how I behave. Yep. I want you to know that I'm committed to a different way of behaving and this is how we're going to try and get that done. Do I need to, to do that kind of thing? I'm fully of the opinion that demonstrating some humility in leadership is actually the best way to bring teams together. And if you need to give a mea culpa, I think it's going to be vastly superior than just alternating, al altering your behavior. They're going to be very skeptical if they suddenly see you showing up different because they don't know why. So right. I think demonstrating some humility in that process is going to take you leaps and bounds forward. I, I totally think that's correct. What about if I'm, I'm in a company and let's say I've been there for, let's say five, 10 years, I'm super committed to the company. The leaders have been there for 2025 20, and I get a sense that they're not that innovative. And I know that we need to push some new initiatives and yet they're resistant. How yeah. can I help them with what I perceive as their resistance or their lack of willingness to change? Yeah. So I think one of the best ways is I, my experience, 80 to 90% of leaders either don't know that they're acting this way, or the, even if they're aware, they don't want to act this way. There's right. sometimes that they just don't, they don't care. Yeah. Right? They're going to do what they're going to do. Right. So that's the leader. You just want to move on and get a new leader. Yeah, um, yeah. But the rest of them, there are careful ways to coach up. And I'm not a huge fan of the, hey, let me give you some feedback. I, I think that for most people causes them to like shut down. Right. So a framing that I learned that was very effective for me is, hey, I have something that might help you. And then this is how actually it was delivered to me. So I'll, I'll give this specific language. That's good. <laughs> uh, John, in that meeting, when Bill offered that idea, he shut down when you responded that we couldn't do it. And yeah. he didn't participate for the rest of the meeting. And I don't think that was your intent. And I was like, Oh, God, no, I, I didn't even notice. And I'm, I was just trying to keep the agenda moving. And this woman, uh, Shelly was like, Hey, if you'd like, I can just keep an eye out 
because I know your intentions are good. And if I see that somebody gets shut down, I'm going to give you a little signal. And, you know, it takes time and repetition to change your behaviors. I'm used to making decisions. That's the way I, I showed up. Yep. And with time, I, I learned when to give the team sort of permission to, to ideate and when I needed to make decisions because we were out of time or what have you. And, and in, in full, I'll tell you this brief story of this. I, my first year at the wireless company, I scored out of 9,000 people. I had one of the lowest scores on the 360 survey. Yeah, yeah. Of anybody <laughs> in the entire company. Because I, I showed up as a knower and I was just judging ideas and making decisions. And I thought that's what the team wanted from me. And they liked it for like a couple of weeks. Right. Um, but then they didn't. So then I, I learned about this construct and I, I went through some you know feedback and coaching uh, from the Center for Creative Leadership. And a year to the day later, by adopting this uh, learner leadership style, which is keeping things open, I actually had one of the top 20 scores out of 9,000 leaders in the same company with the same employees. I didn't turn anybody over. Hmm. So it's really That's interesting. Powerful. That's interesting. And so what I'm hearing from you, and I think this is important to make a note, is that you're you're combining that that learner leadership, that openness to new ideas, with the willingness to be decisive and make decisions. Am I hearing that correctly? Because yeah, it's again, it's like back to walking. You got to do both. Right. Sometimes you've got to make a decision. If they think you're waffling, they're not going to like that at all. Yes. But when it's a big thing that might affect them, I'll give you a specific example. Yeah. Because people are people, and they're really. Interesting sometimes. Yep. I already knew this contract. I was kind of living it. And then we were moving floors from the eighth floor to the ninth floor. So we're moving 50 people up one floor. It's almost the same design, a little bit different. So they gave me a seating chart. It looked fine to me. I signed off on it. It got posted the next day by the front doors. And I had a line of people waiting to get in my office, several of whom were crying. Uh -huh. And I was like, for God's sake, <laughs> we're just moving up a floor. Like, but I, you know, I don't know what I don't know. So, you know, the one woman was crying. She's like, I, it took me three years to, to get this spot near the bathroom. In full disclosure, and embarrassingly, I have IBS and I have to go to the bathroom a lot. And right. now I've got to cross the entire building in front of everybody 10 times a day. This is the worst thing that could have happened to me. Interesting. And so by not knowing what it, and not checking with the team on something that was really easy to check with them, I screwed it all up. Unfortunately, I was able to like unwind and yep. fix it. But this is the, the idea is, you know, when you have time or capacity, check with the team to get their ideas because they're going to have different ways of thinking. That's terrific. So, so the most dangerous thing a leader can say is we tried that before and it doesn't work. Right. So by way of summary, then let's, let's, let's lay out some action items to be able to balance a creative mindset and an innovative mindset with a directive and a decisive mindset. G give us some action items there, please, John. The first action item is when time is of essence, and you have the expertise, make the decision and then let the team know why you had to do it. Mm. They expect that from you. Yep. Um, waffling under pressure is the exact opposite of what they expect from you. Excellent. When you have time or when the decision impacts people directly or when you don't really know the answer, that's the time to involve the team, get their ideas, separate the divergence, the these creation, creative process Yes. From convergence from the judgment of those ideas by just a piece of time, a yes. break, a water cooler, overnight, what have you. When you separate those two, you keep the creativity. Nobody has a problem having their ideas judged once they're all on the board. Right. Okay. So then that, that just leads me then to the last question, because in your experience, let's say you, you get the feedback from people and how do people feel when their ideas are not selected? They get a chance to give their input, but perhaps someone else's ideas get selected. How does that work for the morale of the organization overall? I'll tell you that when no ideas are implemented and they disappear into a black box, you've just killed the culture. Right. Especially when you make a big to-do about gathering ideas. So if you gather ideas, you celebrate them in the moment and then nothing happens, you've just killed it. However, right. People support that which they create. When they are part of a process mm. where their voice is heard, mm -hmm. the ideas get judged. They're part of that, by the way. So they have their voice. And then somebody else's idea is chosen. They're still part of that. Right. So they will support if they're part of the process. When we did this wireless thing, uh, the no contract thing, 
we knew we were going to have major obstacles from legal and from finance. And so we made senior leaders from both of those a part of the ideation process. So they they were in the room, they were judging the ideas, they were throwing up their concerns. But at the end of the day, those were our champions that actually made this happen. I could trust in marketing. Interesting. They trust the marketers, they shouldn't trust the marketers. Okay, so let me just hit on that one last point there because you mentioned something that is very, very important. We've gathered the ideas, we've judged the ideas and picked one or two. How do I avoid that sense that, oh, we spent all this time thinking and nothing ever gets done. What, what do the best leaders do to make sure they actually get into action on some of those ideas? Great, great question. Key number one is you summarize, so you, you don't let them disappear in a black hole. You say, here are the ideas. And then later, once you've vetted some of them, you say, here's the ones we're considering. Yep. And then later, it's, it's really just a communication stream. Here's the cost and timeline for the two or one or whatever we're choosing. Uh, here's who's on the team. And then, you know, for me, one of the best things you can do is find some quick win out of that initial ideation and do it. Yep. Even if you don't know if it's going to work, yes. as long as it's not expensive, people will say, ah, see, they listened. Yes. They listened to me. They listened yep. to us. And when you're putting together that team, are you assigning ultimate accountability to one person who's, who's part of that team or are you just sort of generalizing it? That's a good question. When we were running our innovation sessions, I guess I probably had the tie-breaking vote. Right but it was fairly democratic. Yep. And, and I don't know that I ever had to use it, but I had it. Okay, excellent. Because you wanna be able to get over the hill. Like if the group is stuck 50-50, that's, it's not getting anybody anywhere. Well, but I'm talking about when you're implementing the action itself. So let's say you've, okay, I've, I've got my, I generated the ideas, picked the ideas, and now I'm getting into action. And what can happen sometimes is we agree on the action. We even yeah. put the team together, but, but then it's sort of like, it's a sort of a he shed, you know, they're pointing fingers. So I thought she was gonna do it or he was gonna do it. Right. So, you know, clear accountability, clear action uh, tied to whatever tracks. And here's another thing that I would advise. If you're doing something tr truly difficult or innovative, um, you're, this, the, the antibodies will come out of the system and they're going to come fight you. Yes. You're, you're going to find people that just emerge out of somewhere that are just risk averse and they, they want to kill it. Yep. Um, we agreed as a team that we would be told no, no, seven times before we agreed that no was the answer. And we got pretty close with the chairman of the board. He rejected our proposed strategy multiple times, multiple times. Okay. But each time we found a way to like come back with a different angle and eventually we got it through. See, now that right there is a key insight if you're involved in a, a team that is trying to influence up the chain of command. So you're leading a team, you've made a decision on an innovation and you've got to be willing to hear no seven times. That's interesting. And, and then be willing not just to hear the no, but perhaps to make tweaks so that the no becomes the yes. Am I hearing that right? Exactly right. And one of the best ways to do that, by the way, so people don't trust people that are in love with their idea and they shouldn't because ah. you're, you're, you've got your confirmation bias built in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the way we really got it through is we brought in independent outside experts that were agreed to by both the chairman as well as us. So at least we had a voice into the choice of that. In our case, we brought in, I think it was Bain Consulting, yep. and they did a sort of a meta-analysis of our strategy, and they essentially sold it to the chairman, not us, because he didn't trust us. We were in love with our idea. So that's interesting because when, whenever an innovation or an idea is, is, is put forth, someone else may perceive that as a threat, right? and you want to do your best to get on the same side of the table with them so that right. that threat level is diminished. Exactly right. Interesting. That's very excellent. John, how can people get in touch with you if they, if they want to learn more about this or, or learn more about what you do? Yeah. So, you know, I speak and do workshops for a living. My website is johnkcoil.com. I keep a pretty active blog there. I have a, a lot of topics like knower versus learner that you can dig into there. You can find me on LinkedIn under John K. Coil and uh, always happy to talk. I don't charge for consultations. I don't charge for advice. I don't I'm not a coach or a consultant. I just speak for a living or do workshops. So uh -huh. uh, happy to talk to anybody if they ever want to reach out. Excellent. We'll make sure to get your uh, links in the show notes. And John, I appreciate you joining us here today. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Hi, this is Eric. Just a quick note. I was thinking after my interview with John that the process that he was describing was very similar to my kick-ass meeting process that I have used for over 15 years with construction executives. I put together a little ebook on that process that you can check out on my website. There's a link in the show notes, constructiongenius.com slash K-A-M. 
That stands for kick-ass meetings. And it's a very simple process, but it's extremely powerful. It's designed to help you to go from a blank piece of paper to unanimous agreement as a team on how you're going to solve problems and innovate in your company in less than 37 min minutes. So check out that ebook. It's short, it's to the point, it's super helpful. And thank you for listening to Construction Genius today. Thank you for listening to this episode of Construction Genius. Hope you found that 1% of inspiration to help you in the next few days. If you like the show, please give us a five-star review on iTunes. Share it with other construction leaders who you think would benefit. And thanks again for listening.